To listen to American Scandal one week early and ad-free, join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. This is a special encore presentation of our series on the Hare Krishna murders, which originally aired in 2019. It's an incredible story that spans decades and followed a spiritual group that took a surprisingly dark turn. We hope you enjoy it. Keith Ham is laying in a hospital bed in Pittsburgh, but he doesn't know it. He's been in a coma ever since a mentally ill devotee bashed his head in with a steel pipe. Keith's head is bandaged and his face is swollen and covered with purple bruises. His followers keep a vigil at the hospital chanting and praying for Krishna to save him. But it's been ten days and Keith shows no sign of ever waking up. News of the attack has spread around the world. Devotees have filled temples in 50 countries. Temple leaders preach that there's a divine purpose behind it all. They compare Keith to Jesus and pray that he will return to them. Then, on November 5th, 1985, 10 days after the attack, Keith begins to stir. He's opened his eyes, praise Krishna. Do you know what happened to you? Keith lifts his head and stares at the concerned faces surrounding him. His first words come as a faint whisper. Uh, I'm not sure. Word spreads quickly that Krishna has performed a miracle. Three weeks later, Keith is discharged from the hospital. Hundreds of devotees at New Vrindavan line the road awaiting his arrival. Cheers break out as a van rounds the corner and slowly drives up to the Golden Palace. Ecstatic followers call out his name. He's helped into a wheelchair and taken into his house where he pays homage to the deities in his private temple room. Then he's taken to his bedroom, where senior disciples pay their respects one by one. Everyone is thrilled to have Keith back, but the mood at New Vrindavan is different. Devotees are scared. Rumors are swirling that Steve Bryant is plotting an attack, that he's camped out in the woods with a high-powered rifle waiting to pick people off. Armed guards are posted outside Keith's house. Two guard dogs are at his side 24 hours a day. And then. Keith's favorite pit bull returns to New Vrindavan. Tirta, the community's chief enforcer, is back, and he's been summoned to kill Steve Bryant. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In our last episode, Steve Bryant went public with shocking accusations against Keith Ham, the leader of New Vrindavan. And after a violent attack put Keith in a coma, his closest advisors have decided that Steve must die. This is our final episode, Retribution and Reform. It's a cold December day in 1985. The morning service at New Vrindavan's Palace of Gold has just ended. Tirta slowly strolls by as devotees exit. He loves seeing the shocked expressions on their faces. He's a muscular man of 37 with piercing blue eyes that people often describe as cold or dead. He moved to New Vrindavan eight years ago, and Keith quickly made him the commune's chief enforcer. He took his job very seriously. When a local harassed disciples, Tirta took care of him by applying a baseball bat to the man's knees. And when a devotee named Chuck St. Dennis threatened to expose Keith's sexual escapades, Tirta took care of him, too. He stops and shields his eyes as he reaches the commune's art studio. He nods at the stream that runs nearby. It's his way of saying hi to Chuck, whose decomposing body is buried underneath a stream bed. He's confident it will never be found. He's happy to be back at New Vrindavan again. Keith made him leave after Chuck's murder, but now they need him to kill Steve Bryant. In exchange, Tirtas asked for $8,000 for expenses. The amount has been approved by Keith's senior advisors. They all agree Steve Bryant needs to die. 
Now Tirta just has to find him. In January of 1986, Steve Bryant and Keith Hamm are both on the move. Keith's recovery has been remarkable. Less than three months after emerging from a coma, he's making a triumphant tour of India. In Bombay, a gold Rolls Royce picks him up at the airport. Then they travel to the local temple in a 30-car motorcade led by an elephant. Steve's movements are considerably less glamorous. He flies coach to Detroit and spends a week with his parents. Then he buys a used, generic-looking van, drives to St. Clairsville, Ohio, and checks into a motel. It's 25 miles from New Vrindavan, and it serves as his new home base. On a rainy Monday morning, he sits cross-legged on the sagging bed, looking at his to-do list. He's just composed a flyer that details the crimes committed by Keith and the other gurus. Fraud, child molestation, and murder. It concludes by warning them that their days are numbered. Next on his list are phone calls. First, he checks in with the sheriff in Moundsville and lets him know his whereabouts in case he disappears. Next, he calls his ex-wife, Jane, to warn her he's going to launch an attack on Keith and she should take their sons and leave the commune. He's afraid Keith might harm the boys in retaliation. His words send Jane into a panic. She tries to get him to explain what he means. What sort of attack? Where is he? But Steve hangs up without answering her questions. He's not stupid enough to tell her where he's staying. She'll just tell Keith, and he'll end up dead. Steve puts on a hoodie, grabs his flyer, and heads out the door. He's going to make copies and send them to every newspaper and TV station in the area. Tirta has been looking for weeks, but he hasn't been able to locate Steve. So he enlists Terry Sheldon. Sheldon is the head of the Cleveland Temple. He's smart, pragmatic, and fiercely loyal to Keith. He volunteers to coordinate the search for Steve Bryant. Sheldon suspects Steve has gone back to Los Angeles. He flies there and meets with senior devotees who will set up a surveillance network and report back if they see Steve. He also meets with an enforcer who says he'll give Steve a heroin overdose for $5,000. Sheldon considers it, but decides it's too risky and too expensive. He returns to Cleveland, and he and Tirta drive to Michigan to stake out Steve's parents' house. But there's no sign of Steve there either. They're becoming frustrated. But then, Sheldon comes up with a deceptively simple way to locate Steve. That evening, Steve's mother gets a call from Tim Lee. Tim is one of Steve's best friends, and she's happy to hear from him. Tim explains that he's lost track of Steve, and he figures Steve might need someone to talk to. Steve's mother agrees and says Steve just bought an old Dodge van and is staying near the commune. She gives him the number of Steve's motel, warning him not to share it with anyone. She hangs up, feeling hopeful. She thinks Steve's on a dangerous quest. Maybe Tim can talk some sense into him. But a few blocks away, Terry Sheldon exits a phone booth. He hands Tirton the note he just made. It reads, Old Dodge Van, followed by a phone number of a motel. Tirton laughs and says, Good work, Tim. Mrs. Bryant's going to be bummed when she finds out she gave up her son. The next morning, at 5.30 a.m., Tirta sits in a parked car across the highway from Steve's motel. Randall Gorby sits beside him. Though he's not a Krishna, Gorby has been a friend and supporter of New Vrindavan for years. He's helped to grow, and he doesn't want to see Steve Bryant destroy it. A little after nine, Steve comes out of a motel room and gets into his van. Randall Gorby watches Steve through binoculars. Here we go. Don't follow him too closely. This isn't my first rodeo, Randall. I know what I'm doing. They follow Steve onto the highway, then into downtown Wheeling, West Virginia. He parks in front of an imposing limestone building. Tirta looks Gorby, puzzled. That's the courthouse. What the hell do you think he's up to? Is he filing a suit to get his kids back or something? Gorby shakes his head. That would be a state case. This is the federal courthouse. But you know what else is in that building? Gorby pauses, watching Steve disappear inside before he continues. The local office of the FBI. Here to pounce his armrest. That son of a bitch is going to the police, and he is going to have to be killed, and I am the one that's going to do it. Gorby stares out the window. There's something he's not telling Tirta. The reason he knows that building houses the FBI office is because Randall Gorby is a government informant. 
February 5th is overcast, and the spires of the new Vrindavan temples peek through the mist. Deputy Thomas Westfall cruises slowly through the commune, looking for familiar faces. Ever since the attack on Keith Ham, Westfall has been uneasy. Steve Bryant's press releases have both the Krishnas and the locals on edge. He recognizes two young women and asks if they've heard anything about Steve Bryant recently. The women's eyes go wide. Just this morning, they heard Steve's forming a militia to storm the Palace of Gold and kill everyone. To Westfall, that sounds crazy, but he has to admit, Steve seems like a guy who could snap at any moment. Westfall says he'll do his best to keep them all safe, but it feels like an empty promise. Later that afternoon, Tirta follows Steve's van through Moundsville. He's been keeping tabs on him and reporting back to Sheldon. He follows Steve as he pulls onto the highway, staying behind a delivery truck so Steve doesn't see him. But the truck abruptly exits, and Steve looks in his rearview mirror and recognizes Tirta's car. Steve floors it. Tirta finds a phone booth and calls Sheldon. They both agree that Steve is probably going to head back to Los Angeles, and Tirta should go there and put together a team to track Steve down. Tirta gets on a plane that evening. But Steve isn't going to Los Angeles. In fact, he's not going anywhere for the next 90 days. Because the next morning, Steve's awakened by a loud knock on the door of his motel room. He cautiously peers out and sees two sheriff's deputies. They tell him that his ex-wife and the president of New Vrindavan have filed complaints, alleging that Steve has made violent threats against them. They search Steve's room and find an unlicensed handgun. Steve is taken to the county jail, where he spends eight weeks awaiting his trial. Steve makes the disastrous decision to represent himself in court. On April 3rd, 1986, he's convicted on a weapons charge and he vows to appeal it. His father puts up bail and eight days later, Steve walks out of the Moundsville jail. Tirta is waiting and watching. He follows him all the way back to Detroit, but Steve knows he's being tailed. He says goodbye to his parents and discreetly slips out of town. Tirta's lost him again. But what Tirta doesn't know is that Steve has given up his fight. He no longer feels like he can win. Plenty of people believe his allegations, but most of them have left the movement or are afraid to come forward. It's been a one-man battle, and it's cost him everything he cares about. His wife, his children, and his freedom. Steve realizes it's finally time to move on. So he goes back to Three Rivers, California, and reconnects with an old girlfriend. Three weeks later, he proposes. He gets a lead on a job in a picturesque town near the Oregon border. Things are finally looking up. He decides to drive to Los Angeles and visit some old friends, then go interview for the job. When he returns, they'll get married, start a new life together. But when Steve gets to Los Angeles, a devotee who is part of the surveillance spots him. He calls Terry Sheldon, who calls Tirta, who immediately gets on a plane. On March 23rd, Deputy Westfall's at his desk filling out a stolen vehicle report when his phone rings. It's a detective from Los Angeles. Steve Bryant has been shot twice in the head while sitting in his parked van. The detective says Steve's friends insist it was a religious assassination and they know who did it. Westfall jumps to his feet and asks if they've mentioned the name Tirta. The detective says yes, that's who they claim killed Steve. Westfall grabs his files and fills the detective in on Keith and the Krishna's suspected illegal activities. He tells him that Tirta murdered another man three years ago, but the inept county prosecutor wouldn't file charges. The L.A. detective says they're taking Bryant's murder very seriously. They're enlisting the West Virginia State Police and the FBI. Westfall is pumped. Now he's finally got the resources he needs to arrest Tirta, Keith, and shut down the Krishna's criminal operations. It's May 24th, two days after Steve Bryant's murder. Tirta stands in the tiny kitchen of the rundown mobile home he shares with his wife and son in Ravenna, Ohio. In one hand, he holds a phone. His other hand grips the edge of the kitchen counter so hard he might snap it right off. He yells into the phone, You promised me $8,000 to do the deed. I did it, and now you're haggling? His wife and son scurry by, carrying suitcases out to their Azuzu trooper. Tirta slams down the phone, enraged. 
He was told that everything's taken care of, that he'll be paid after killing Bryant, and he and his family will fly to India, where a wealthy devotee is standing by to help them start new lives. But now Keith and the leaders who ordered the hit are panicking. They're worried they might be under police surveillance. They're afraid to be seen with Tirta. He can't even get Keith on the phone. He doesn't care if he never sees any of them for the rest of his life. He just wants to be paid so he can get out of the country before the cops catch up to him. He decides to call Randall Gorby, the man he was with on the stakeout outside Steve's motel. Keith respects Gorby. Maybe he can intervene. Tirta's so angry he can barely dial the number. When Gorby picks up the phone, he tries to talk Tirta down. He tells him he'll go up to the commune and see if he can get the cash. Tirta makes him promise to do it the moment he hangs up the phone. But when the call ends, Randall doesn't move because an FBI agent is sitting right next to him and Tirta just confessed to murder. American Scandal is sponsored by the mobile mystery game June's Journey. I think my favorite genre is the mystery. Whatever I'm reading, watching, or listening to, set in space or Victorian London, it doesn't matter if the thrill of the mystery is there. There's just nothing like a good whodunit. The intrigue, the possible suspects, the red herrings, they pull you in. But what if you could really join in on the hunt? If you love classic murder mysteries as much as I do, and want to test your powers of observation, the hidden object game June's Journey will awaken your inner sleuth. This free-to-download mobile game puts your perception and awareness to the test, not to mention your memory and logic skills. It certainly keeps me on my toes as I search for hidden objects and collect clues to solve the mystery, unlocking new chapters of the story each time getting closer to the truth. Join 30 million other fans who have found their inner detectives with June's Journey. Endless hours of fun with thousands of intricate scenes and new chapters every week. There's a detective in all of us. Find yours. Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. It's the first week of June, 1986. Deputy Westfall sits in a conference room at the West Virginia State Police Department in Wheeling. An air conditioner rattles behind him. In front of him is a box overflowing with files. The state police have asked Westfall to help them build their case. They don't have any solid evidence that Tirta killed Steve Bryant. But Westfall has plenty of evidence that Tirta killed another devotee three years earlier. The state troopers listen intently as he picks up a sheaf of papers and adjusts his reading glasses. This is a statement from Nick Sacrios. He's the medic up in the commune. Nick said, Tirta told me that they shot Chuck St. Dennis 12 times and stabbed him repeatedly. He wanted to know how it was medically possible that Chuck was still on his feet. It was my impression that his primary emotion was not remorse, but curiosity. That's one bad dude. <laughs> That's one hell of an understatement. The trooper leans back in his chair and cocks his head. Something doesn't make sense. Wait, you're telling me you had a sworn statement from a witness that the perp flat out confessed and the prosecutor wouldn't take the case? Yes, sir, that's correct. Well, that's bullshit. Let's get a warrant. Westfall smiles. If he wasn't such a tough son of a bitch, he might even shed a tear. He promised Chuck's widow he'd bring Tirta to justice, even if it took 10 years. But it's only been three. Westfall's ahead of schedule. Early on Tuesday morning, five days after Steve Bryant's murder, Tirta and his family are on the road. They're driving from Ohio to New York. From there, they'll fly to India and be out of the reach of the law. After a lot of arm twisting, temple leaders finally coughed up $3,500. It's not even half of what he was promised, and worse, it's all in small bills. Tirta's afraid he might arouse suspicion by getting on a plane with a suitcase full of cash, but he doesn't want to spend the time searching for a bank. Just as he's about to get on the freeway, he sees a bank down the block. He tells his wife he'll run in and get the money changed into large bills. Then they'll be on their way. But as he pulls into the bank parking lot, he sees a police car coming toward him. His chest tightens. He stares straight ahead, avoiding eye contact. He's relieved when the cops drive past. But the cops have seen him, and they've noticed his vehicle matches the description the state troopers sent out that morning. The cops make a U-turn and pull in behind him, then jump out of their patrol car with guns drawn. Tirta follows the officer's orders, slowly exiting the vehicle with his hands raised. He drops to his knees and places his forehead on the ground, it's the position of surrender he'd assumed countless times before speaking to Keith or the Swami, 
but now it's the surrender he hoped he'd never have to face. Two years, 11 months, and 17 days after he killed Chuck St. Dennis, Tirta has finally been arrested for the crime. Deputy Westfall is thrilled when he gets the news. He can finally look Chuck's widow in the eye and feel proud to be a cop. He's still got plenty of work ahead of him, though. Tirta had an accomplice in Chuck's murder, and Westfall wants him behind bars, too. But the grand prize is still Keith Ham. And if Tirta will talk, say that Keith ordered the hit, then Keith goes to prison for the rest of his life. But that's a big if. Tirta's not the type to rat out his co-conspirators, even if he's offered a plea bargain. Back at the commune, the news of Tirta's arrest is both a relief and a worry. For those who never much cared for the guy, life will be more pleasant without him around. But Keith and his advisors are sweating. Tirta knows way too much. The next morning, Randall Gorby is sleeping in when his phone rings. He shakes himself awake and fumbles for the phone. Oh, Gorby here. Randall, it's Trooper Knight. Did, did I wake you? No, no, I'm up. Just hanging out. You know, it's a crime to make a false statement to a law enforcement officer. Well, then in that case, yes, I was asleep. Why are you calling so damn early? We were wondering if you could come in this morning and go over some of your testimony. Again? Randall grabs a pack of cigarettes off the nightstand and fishes one out. You're our star witness for the murder trial. We want to get all our ducks in a row. All right, okay, sure. What time? Does 11 work? Yeah, I suppose so. You know those things will kill you, right? <laughs> I've been smoking for over 15 years, and I'm still here. Randall Gorby's house explodes, blasting a hole in the roof and setting the place ablaze. His pajamas are burned off his body as debris rains down on him. When an ambulance arrives, medics rush him to the hospital with third-degree burns covering most of his body. He's in a coma, and the doctors don't know if he'll survive. At New Vrindaban, a few days later, a young couple hastily pack their belongings into an old sedan. They're in a hurry to leave, and they're not the only ones. Devotees are starting to see Steve Bryant's allegations in a new light. He said Keith authorized a murder, and now, with Steve dead, it looks like that's true. And someone's blown up Randall Gorby's house. The devotees want to get out before their peaceful, idyllic community turns into a war zone. In July of 1986, Keith sits in the back of a small Indian car that's parked on a side street in Bombay. Terry Sheldon and another man are crammed into the back with him. A fourth sits in the passenger seat. They've told their driver to take a walk. It's stifling inside the car, but they don't dare open the windows for fear of being overheard. They've all played a part in the plot to kill Steve Bryant, and they've met to discuss what to say if they're indicted. Even if the air conditioning was on, they'd still be sweating. Keith insists that Krishna will guide and protect them, but this sounds more like denial than faith. Meanwhile, the movement is continuing to fracture. Some of Keith's advisors abruptly leave New Vrindavan. The head of the Los Angeles Book Trust resigns after he's caught having an affair with a teenage girl. A guru in Australia is ousted for having an affair with a teenage boy. Back in West Virginia, Randall Gorby is recovering from his burns. The investigation into his house exploding revealed that someone unscrewed a valve, allowing gas to fill the house, but the police haven't been able to identify a suspect. After seven weeks in the hospital, Gorby's released, but he doesn't visit friends or go back and rebuild his house. He disappears without a trace. The feds have put him into the witness protection program. When Keith returns to New Vrindavan, he uses Temple funds to hire a lawyer for his case, but leaves Tirta to fend for himself. Tirta has to make do with a public defender, but just as Westfall suspected, Tirta rejects a plea bargain. It looks like he'll carry his secrets to the grave, and Keith will remain free. By September, the commune is decimated. So many devotees have left that Keith has to lay off the entire staff. The printing press that used to crank out counterfeit stickers and baseball caps to sell at ball games and concerts sits idle. 
And with no one left to run the dairy and all incoming funds going to Keith's legal defense, New Vrindavan's sacred cows begin to starve. Then, in November, tragedy strikes. Steve Bryant's youngest son drowns in a pond on the commune. It appears to be an accident, but Keith blames Steve. He issues a statement saying it happened because Steve's family has bad karma. But then, Keith's own bad karma catches up to him. A grand jury convenes to investigate the connection between Keith and Steve Bryant's death. On December 5th, 1986, Deputy Westfall sits in the county courthouse in Kingwood, West Virginia, nervously waiting for the jury to return a verdict in Tirta's trial for the murder of Chuck St. Dennis. He surprised the courtroom's only half full for what he considers one of the biggest cases of his career. Tirta sits with his public defender, staring at his hands. Prosecutor Tom White looks worried. Westfall can't stand him. He's the same guy who refused to file charges when Westfall brought him the case three years ago. He didn't want to take the case this time either. He's afraid he'll lose and he won't be reelected. But Westfall is worried too. Steve's widow, Deborah, and Dr. Nick testified and they seemed credible. Randall Gorby even came out of witness protection to take the stand. But Tirta's accomplice, Dan Reed, refused to testify even when he was offered a plea deal. And Chuck's body has never been found. The jury could go either way. Westfall holds his breath as the jury files in. They've only been deliberating for four hours, and that's not a good sign. He glances over at Deborah. She's trembling. The judge asks the jury foreman if they've reached a verdict. The foreman rises, tells the judge they have, then delivers the verdict. Guilty. Westfall lets out his breath as Deborah sobs with relief. Tirta remains expressionless, looking straight ahead. Westfall is finally starting to feel optimistic. One down, two to go. Dan Reed and Keith Hamm are next. He won't rest until he's three for three, and he doesn't have to wait long. The next day, he gets a call from the prosecutor. Dan Reed has changed his tune. He's pleading guilty and has offered to lead them to Chuck's body in return for leniency. Westfall pulls together a crew of officers armed with shovels and pickaxes. They pile into a truck and head for New Vrindavan. Shortly after they arrive, it starts raining, hard. Reed shows them the stream bed where they buried Chuck, but he can't remember the exact location. He makes his best guess, but says it could be 20 feet in either direction. Westfall and his men begin to dig in the rain. It's difficult work. As soon as they excavate a hole, it fills up with mud and water. After four hours, they're ready to call it quits. An officer plunges his shovel into the mud one last time, and a human hand rises from the muck. Westfall stares at it. It's like Chuck is reaching out to him. At least he'll finally get a proper burial. Westfall knows that Keith is the smartest and most cunning of them all. Maybe he won't be able to nail him for conspiracy to commit murder, but they got Al Capone for tax evasion. Sometimes you just need to be creative. It's January 5th, 1987, and a cold wind blows across New Vrindavan. Keith Ham drives his Jeep slowly through the commune. He passes the accounting office. That used to be his favorite spot, where devotees would bring him suitcases full of cash they made from selling drugs and running scams, millions of dollars a year. But now the cash flow has dwindled. The commune is a shell of what it used to be. Cabins are empty and falling into disrepair. He drives past the greenhouse that Chuck St. Dennis built. It was only a few years ago, but it seems like a lifetime. He told Tirta to kill Chuck, and now Tirta has been sentenced to life in prison for it and is being extradited to Los Angeles to stand trial for Steve Bryan's murder. Keith Ham wishes things had turned out differently, but he doesn't feel regret. Regret is for mortals, and Keith Ham is divine. He stops at the top of a ridge and surveys his domain. It's not over. Krishna will get him through this, and new Vrindavan will rise from the ashes. But then Keith sees something that makes his heart stop. A line of police cars scream down the highway, and they're turning onto the road to the commune. New Vrindavan is being raided. By the end of the day, 25 officers have packed three semi-trailers full of evidence. They take the hats, t-shirts, and stickers that devotees have been selling at sporting events and concerts. They also seize computers, file cabinets, cash, and financial records. 
Deputy Westfall, along with state and federal authorities and the IRS, are seizing evidence to charge Keith with racketeering. They collect enough evidence to file the largest trademark infringement case in U.S. history. Keith gears up for the fight of his life. He's going to do what he does best, preach. This time, he preaches that he's the innocent victim of a government plot. He goes on a year-long First Amendment freedom tour, and he does interviews with Dan Rather, Larry King, and anyone else who will talk to him. By the end of the year, he's appeared on 90 radio programs and 60 TV shows. The day after each interview, Keith pours over the ratings, keeping a running tab of how many people he reached. It's taking the government years to assemble a case against him, and he's going to use that time to try his case in the court of public opinion. But on August 31st, 1989, three and a half years after the raid at New Vrindavan, Keith Ham suffers a devastating blow. Howard Wheeler dies of spinal cancer. Howard was his lover, his trusted advisor, and the co-founder of New Vrindavan. Keith feels like everything is slipping away. On May 24, 1990, nine months after Howard's death, the grand jury charges Keith with five counts of racketeering, six counts of mail fraud, and conspiracy to murder Steve Bryant and Chuck St. Dennis. The star witness will be FBI informant Randall Gorby. But on July 24th, Gorby is found dead in his car from carbon monoxide poisoning. Officially, it's a suicide. On the other side of the country, Tirta is waiting to stand trial for the murder of Steve Bryant. He claims he's being mistreated at the Los Angeles jail. He claims they refuse to give him vegetarian meals, and he's surviving on milk and orange juice. He shares a four-man cell with five other inmates. He longs to be back in his one-man cell in West Virginia. His trial begins in November and concludes when the jury deadlocks. But it's hardly a victory since he's already serving a life sentence. And now he's stuck in the crowded Los Angeles jail until he's retried. Back in West Virginia, Deputy Westfall is disappointed to hear the news of the deadlock, but he's anxiously awaiting the main event, the trial of Keith Ham. Three and a half months later, Keith sits at the defense table in a courtroom in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Westfall sits in the gallery behind the prosecution table, nervously tapping his foot in anticipation. He's been waiting for this day for almost 20 years. Keith scans the room and sees two gurus who are his longtime rivals sitting in the back. They smile, but to Keith they look like vultures, waiting to swoop in if New Vrindavan is forfeited to the government. One person who is conspicuously absent is Tirta. He has steadfastly refused to testify. Some speculate that Keith is paying him off. The judge gavels the proceedings to order, and the prosecutor makes his opening statement. He begins by claiming that Keith authorized Steve Bryant's murder because he feared Bryant would expose him as a pedophile. Then he lays out the other charges in excruciating detail. Westfall spends nearly an entire day on the stand, testifying about the scams and counterfeiting operations that led to the racketeering charges and explaining how Keith illegally amassed a profit of more than $10.5 million. The following day, the prosecution builds their case that Keith ordered two murders. The defense calls new Vrindavan residents, who all praise Keith's noble character, wisdom, and saintliness. After 17 days of testimony on Good Friday, the jury announces they've reached a verdict. Keith takes it as a sign that, like Jesus, he will rise again. West Falls hoping Keith gets nailed to the cross. American Scandal is sponsored by Sleep Number. Right now, I am staring at a blank screen, rubbing my eyes and feeling a bit foggy. I'm tired, and it's affecting my entire day. But I did this to myself, opting to watch one more episode instead of turning out the lights like I should have. If you haven't already figured this out, how you sleep is pretty much how you feel. A good night's sleep helps you feel better, think better, and live better. Of course, it helps to have a better bed, too. Sleep number beds adjust from feather soft to supportive and firm, and you can set each side to the perfect sleep number setting for you and your partner. I think I found my sleep number at 40, but my wife might prefer her side of our sleep number 360i10 smart bed, a tad softer at 35. 
But Sleep Number smart beds not only adjust to your ideal firmness, but their Sleep IQ app tracks how well you sleep and measures your best sleep hours, heart rate, breathing, and movement. And you can use this data to improve your sleep. Discover special offers now for a limited time at your local Sleep Number store or at sleepnumber.com slash AS. Sleep Number. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. It's March 29, 1991. The courtroom in Martinsburg, West Virginia is buzzing with anticipation. Keith Ham's trial has concluded, and he's about to hear his fate. The jury files in, and Keith stands, leaning on the cane he's had to use since polio almost left him paralyzed as a teenager. He thinks of all the other things he survived, being unjustly committed to a mental hospital, wrongly branded as a heretic, a violent attack that should have killed him. He's confident he'll survive this, too. He watches impassively as the judge addresses the jury. Members of the jury, in the case of the United States versus Keith Gordon Ham, on the count of conspiracy to commit murder of Charles St. Dennis, have you reached a verdict? The jury foreman rises. No, Your Honor. The jury is deadlocked. Keith allows himself a tiny smile. Deputy Westfall stops breathing. In the case of the United States versus Keith Gordon Ham on the count of conspiracy to commit murder of Steve Bryant, have you reached a verdict? Your Honor, we're deadlocked on that one too. Now, Keith does smile. Westfall drops his head into his hands. We have nine remaining counts of racketeering and mail fraud. Have you reached a verdict on any of those? We have, Your Honor. Keith closes his eyes and says a prayer. Krishna has always protected him, and it looks like he'll continue to do so. We find the defendant guilty as charged. The judge goes through the remaining counts and the foreman gives the same answer for each. Guilty as charged. Keith collapses into his chair and Westfall leaps to his feet. That evening, Westfall sits in the bar at his hotel and celebrates with a shot of their best whiskey. There were so many times over the past two decades he was ready to give up. But he's finally done it. He's shut down the criminal enterprise known as New Vrindavan, and he's sending its chief architect to jail. But Westfall's celebration is premature. Keith is sentenced to 30 years in prison, but a few weeks later, he files an appeal and is released on bail. He hires Alan Dershowitz, a celebrity lawyer who will later gain fame as part of O.J. Simpson's defense team. In December, Westfall gets the news that a second jury has found Tirta guilty, and he's been sentenced to another life term. It's cold comfort, though, because Keith is still free. The judge ruled that Keith couldn't go back to New Vrindavan pending his appeal, so at least he's no longer in Westfall's backyard. But it keeps him up at night to think that Keith could get away with murder. On July 1st, 1993, Deputy Westfall gets a call. It's one of his colleagues from the FBI. Did you hear the news about Swami Keith, he asks. Westfall says he hasn't. The agent sighs and continues. Dershowitz got him off on a technicality. Remember how the prosecutor said that Keith had Steve Bryant killed because he was going to expose Keith as a pedophile? Yeah, Westfall answers. And he is. So what? Well, Keith wasn't on trial for child molestation, the agent explains. So Dershowitz argued that bringing that up prejudiced the jury. The judge bought it. It's a mistrial. Keith Ham is a free man. Westfall prides himself as a calm, controlled man. But right now, it takes everything he's got not to scream at the top of his lungs. In early August, Keith triumphantly returns to New Vrindavan. A huge sign hanging from the greenhouse proclaims, Welcome home, Master. While he still has about a hundred loyal followers at the commune, Many devotees elsewhere wish he would disappear. He's brought a lot of negative publicity to the movement, and that's made it difficult to attract new members. But Keith has no intention of retiring. He may be a free man now, but there will be a retrial, so he's going to make the most of every day he has left. There's a huge five-day religious celebration in Chicago at the end of the month, and Keith insists on going. He travels there in a Winnebago, And on the way back, his driver sees something, something disturbing. Keith is in the back with a teenage boy. They're behind a privacy curtain, 
but the Winnebago hits a bump, and the driver glances in the rearview mirror, ready to apologize in case Keith was jostled. What he sees instead is that the privacy curtain has swung open, and Keith and the boy are having sex. Up until this moment, the driver has been a loyal disciple. But now he realizes the rumors about Keith are true and that he can't stay silent, not in good conscience. When they arrive back at New Vrindavan, the driver confides in a few friends. One advises him to remain silent, reminding him what happened to the others who accused Keith of child molestation. And as the story spreads, the driver gets death threats and is forced to flee. But the story, becoming known as the Winnebago incident, splits what's left of the community. Some new Vrindavan residents will blindly support Keith no matter what he does. But for others, this is the final straw. Keith's second trial begins on April 16, 1996. The courtroom is packed. Westfall is anxious to testify. He'll take the stand for a week if he needs to. He glances at Keith, who has a beatific smile. What Westfall wouldn't give to wipe that smile off his face. As the trial is about to begin, the doors at the back of the room open and a man walks in, flanked by two policemen. He wears an orange jumpsuit and he's in handcuffs. Westfall figured they must have made a mistake and brought a defendant into the wrong courtroom. But then the man turns and Westfall recognizes him. It's Tirta. Keith recognizes him too and his face goes pale. If Tirta testifies that Keith ordered the murders, he'll go to prison for the rest of his life. Keith leans in and frantically whispers in his lawyer's ear. As Tirta takes a seat behind the prosecution's table, Keith's lawyer jumps up and asks to confer with the judge. He demands to know what's going on. The judge explains that Tirta has agreed to testify for the state. Keith's lawyer turns to the DA, furious, screaming, did you make some sort of deal to commute his sentence? That's misconduct. But the DA scoffs. No, the only deal he made is with his own conscience. He's finally realized who and what Keith Ham is. His testimony is going to put your client away for the rest of his life. After years of keeping his mouth shut and loyally protecting Keith, Tirta finally had a change of heart when he heard about the Winnebago incident. He realized that the rumors he always denied are true. Keith really was molesting boys. His spiritual master, a man he looked up to like a god and even killed for, is not a god at all. He is just a very, very flawed man. The threat of Tirta's testimony is devastating. He agreed to say that Keith ordered him to commit both murders, adding, you have to understand that in my mind, it wasn't murder. It was dispatching an undesirable element from the community. On April 18th, Keith's lawyer stands and addresses the judge. Your Honor, my client wishes to change his plea in the racketeering and mail fraud charges. Okay. Mr. Ham, the judge replies, how do you wish to plead? Keith stands slowly. He looks out at the courtroom. They're all there. Westfall, Steve's parents, Deborah, the rival gurus, his remaining followers, locals and reporters. They're all looking at him wrapped and silent, hanging on his every word, giving him the attention he's always craved. But this time, he has no pearls of wisdom or stories of Krishna to share. Just three short words. Guilty, Your Honor. Westfall closes his eyes. He can't believe it's finally over. Yes, Keith did not plead guilty to the murders, and the DA won't want to risk another mistrial. Still, Keith is finally going to prison, and that's what matters. On August 29, 1996, Deputy Westfall celebrates again when Keith is sentenced to the maximum possible term, 20 years. In June of 2004, Keith is released early due to poor health. He served eight years. He goes to live with his few remaining disciples in New York City. But within months, he's accused of fondling another boy. No charges are filed, but his disciples are again split into two camps. Those who still consider him divine and incapable of wrongdoing, and those who want him evicted. The true believers prevail, and Keith is allowed to stay. Four years later, he moves to a temple outside Bombay. His disciples construct a rooftop suite for him that they dub his Palace of Love and treat him like an honored guest. On October 24, 
2011, Keith Ham, Kirtanananda, dies of kidney failure. Terry Sheldon was indicted as a co-conspirator in Steve Bryant's death. He accepted a plea bargain and was sentenced to five years in prison. He now lives near New Vrindavan and teaches organic gardening to the community. Dan Reed pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and was also sentenced to five years in prison. When he was released, he went into the witness protection program. In 1993, Hamza Dutta, the former head of the Berkeley Temple who shot up a Cadillac dealership, wrote a public apology. He said that he will now devote himself to restoring the vision of the movement's founder, Swami Prabhupada. Hamsa Dutta lives in Northern California. Tirta is serving a life sentence in West Virginia. He has written several books, including The Definitive Guide to Practicing Krishna Consciousness in Prison. Deputy Westfall left the Sheriff's Department in 2002 and went to work as an investigator for the Marshall County Prosecutor's Office. He retired in 2012 after a 45-year career in law enforcement. In 2018, New Vrindavan celebrated its 50th anniversary. It has over 300 residents, including Steve Bryant's ex-wife, Jane. The Palace of Gold attracts 30,000 visitors each year. More than 50 years after an old man stepped off a freighter in New York City, the religious movement he founded is still thriving. After Keith's sentencing, reformers took control. They expelled corrupt leaders and instituted new oversight measures. Today, there are currently 400 Hare Krishna temples around the world and nearly 100,000 full-time devotees. May 22, 2018 is an overcast day in Los Angeles. A small group of people gather at Cheviot Hill Park on the city's west side. They make their way to the picnic area, which is shaded by an enormous banyan tree. They sing songs and offer flowers to commemorate a man who was frequently difficult, sometimes violent, but always seeking. He sought enlightenment to temples around the world, but didn't find it. He sought love from his wife, but it wasn't returned. And he sought the company of his two sons, but it was denied. The group is there to commemorate the 32nd anniversary of the death of Steve Bryant. Hare Krishna. From Wondery, this is episode six of the Hari Krishna murders from American Skin. In our next series, we look at a government lab in Massachusetts that was supposed to be testing drugs confiscated from potential criminals, but facing pressure to produce results, one employee resorted to a criminal scheme herself, causing tens of thousands of convictions to be overturned. A quick note about our reenactments. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Sound designed by Derek Barnes. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Steve Chivers, edited by Andrew Stelzer. Our consultant for this series is Henry Doktorsky, author of the book Killing for Krishna. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Marsha Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.